you know, how do we tell a story? What is the point of this? How are we drawing people in? So whether the audience are fellow academics or other, other academics outside of transportation or to the public. I think the thing about transportation that is compelling for this narrative is, again, everyone has a lived experience trying to navigate the world and to move around in it. So we naturally have a way to draw people in and, and relate to people's experiences, which may not be true of other scientific kinds of research. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Professor Kelly Clifton from the University of British Columbia. And we are gonna be talking about a creative project that she was involved with, uh, really bringing the work of land use and transportation into the world of comics. <laughs> it's a fun one. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get right to it with Professor Kelly Clifton. Kelly Clifton, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. So Kelly, I love uh, giving my guests uh, just a, a quick opportunity to introduce themselves. So who is Kelly? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm a professor of community and regional planning at the University of British Columbia. Uh, my research focuses on the interactions between people's transportation decisions and the built environment. Uh, and I have a real interest in uh, visual communication. So how we as academics can do a better job of getting our research in the hands of the public and in the hands of decision makers. Fantastic. That's great. So w when you say visual communication, um, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that uh, there's a lot of power in imagery, and I've spent most of my life writing academic papers, which I'm pretty sure don't get in the hands of a lot of people, uh, right. or at least not the public. And and so I think there's there's uh, I've always been interested in art and and just visual images, and I think that there's a lot of power there to make some of the work that we do more accessible to the public. So we're here today to talk about my comic book, but I also think visual imagery could be things like film, other kinds of narrative art. I, I'm working with a student now on some art as a way to talk about um, urban planning issues. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And, and in fact, that that's exactly what caught my att attention um, out on LinkedIn. Um, it, it was, it, I, I can't remember exactly when it was, it might've been back in, in January, um, uh, when, when this particular article came out and I, it piqued my interest immediately moving from cars to people, a comic about transportation and land use. How brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I guess, you know, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, when we think of, of comic books, oftentimes we think of children, um, but in reality, uh, there, there's a much, it's, it's more nuanced than that. There, it's, it's, it's not as straightforward as just, you know, comics kids. Absolutely. Uh, I, uh, and before I started this project, I was new to comics, actually. I was never an avid comics reader. And one of the things I learned in this process is one, how complicated a good comic can be. So again, the combination of words and visual, there's a whole theory of comics and comics communication. Uh, and there's a lot of subtleties in terms of how imagery is placed and the type of images, where the text is, and then what you what, which of those two you choose to communicate ideas with. And so they become a very powerful tool for adults. Um, I, and I think more importantly, they are fun. So reading my academic papers might not be so fun, but reading a comic is much more fun and engaging uh, and takes a shorter amount of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in fact, if we go back over to this, uh, this particular article and we kind of zoom in on, on the graphic, this is a nice, uh, good look at the entire cover page uh, or the cover uh, of the actual comic. And uh, talk, talk a little bit about that inspiration um, of, of talking about this topic in this format. Yeah, so the inspiration, I guess, for the comic itself came from 
actually something I was doing for fun during COVID. So I've always kind of played around with art and drawing and painting. I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy it. And so, uh, and, and, and during COVID, I, uh, I took a comic book class for fun. So again, at that point, I was never a very um, avid comic reader, didn't know that much about comics. Uh, and at the, the same time with my job, I was trying to find ways of thinking about alternative ways to communicate and get the public's hands on the kinds of ideas, not just mine, but other, other researchers. So I, I took this class. And the, the instructor was Ryan uh, Alexander Tanner, who is a professional comic artist and illustrator. And in the first day of the class, he started talking about the theory of comics, which again was a surprise to me. Oh, there's a the theory of comics. Hmm. And he showed a graphic from R. Crumb. And he, he's this, he specializes in nonfiction comics. And he showed this, this graphic from R. Crumb that is a, I think it's a short history of America and it's a 16 panel visual with, with no words. Mm -hmm. And he said, how many words would it take to describe what's happening in this, this comic? And again, I was taking this class, not with my academic hat on, but as uh, in my non-work pursuits and I said, well, I teach that class in transportation and land use, and it takes at least about 10 or 11 weeks to get through all the things that have happened in this comic, uh, in this one succinct visual. And that really sort of blew my mind and got me hooked on comics as maybe something that I would want to explore as part of my work. And so I have a long collaboration with Christy Kearns, who's at the University of Arizona, and we had been doing work on trip generation. And so, so we, we started thinking about, well, how might we use this format to communicate some of the ideas that we have been working on uh, for the last 10 years? Yeah, gosh, fantastic. I mean, did he have any idea that you were in, in the class or, I mean, th this is just like on the nose spot on for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had he had no idea, but it uh, led to a very fruitful collaboration because in one of the breakouts, I was supposed to be working on my own comic, which uh, is was actually like a remake of something my brother and I did as as kids. And I said, "Hey, I I want to do this project for myself, but I have another idea. What if we pursued some grant funding opportunities through the National Institute of Transportation and Communities, which is housed at Portland State University?" And I said, what if we pursued some funding to make a comic about transportation and land use? And it was a new endeavor for him, and he was very excited. And Christy and I applied for the grant with Ryan as our editor, along with Susan Kirtley, who is a professor of English and the director of comic studies at Portland State University. And we got it. So uh, it was a year-long collaboration. Yeah. What a what a magnificent panel! Um, do you know what year this is that that Arkham did this particular one? Um, it was in the early seventies. Um, I think I can find it, but I know it was in the early seventies. It's probably actually at the bottom of the panel, but it's just a little blurred, and I couldn't uh, couldn't actually see it. But you you look at the 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 that last panel in the cars look like they're from the seventies. <laughs> so, That's right. But what a, but what a, you know, again, in, in just this one, you know, panel being able, or in a series of panels being able to see, oh my gosh, yeah, this is like a brief history of, you know, the United States and land use and the challenges and the disaster. And, you know, and, and part of also, I think is very, very interesting too, is that the, the, what ends up, you know, coming out in, in the actual, you know, comic that you put together is, you know, sort of communicating some of these frustrations that people have and being able uh, to try to navigate their space. Um, and I, I think that this is really, really interesting. If you were to, if you were to like say, who, who's, who's your audience for, for the, for the comic book? Great question. Um, I think the audience is really 
the public who's more interested in understanding these issues. But I also think it's a tool for engagement in pedagogy. So if uh, if someone's taking an undergraduate or graduate introductory class, this is a great succinct way to sort of set the stage for a more sophisticated literature and reading. It's for advocacy groups that want to try again to also set the stage for some of the complicated issues that we're trying to navigate in cities as we are transition trying to transition to more sustainable, healthful, and equitable modes. So it you know, allows us to understand a little bit about how we got here, but also, you know, what are some of the tools that have enabled and specifically the, the tools around transportation and land development and the process, uh, the planning process that have led to a very auto-oriented environment. And then the last, so the comic is divided into three sections and the first two kind of get at that history what is the process that we use to plan for transportation and land development? And then the last piece is trying to understand where some of the conflicts and trade-offs that happen with people as we're trying to shift away from auto-oriented development. And people really feel the pinch point because we have, it takes a long time to make this transition. Right. And uh, these are a couple of uh, images that you sent over about the creative process and, and, and being able to kind of, make your way towards what it will eventually be, you know, the, um, the final product. And, uh, in just a couple of panels, I mean, this is, this is something that is very recognizable from, uh, from the actual final product, but it looks like these were the early stages. Is that correct? Yeah. So the process was an iterative one. We had a very interdisciplinary team. So Christy and I, are not comic artists, are not comic narrators or editors. We understood the transportation angle and the points that we wanted to make, or at least we thought we understood the points that we wanted to make. And so Susan Kirtley helped with thinking about narrative. And then we had a graduate student who is uh, Joaquin Goles, who was an MFA in studio art at Portland State University. And so all of the artwork and illustrations are, are Joaquin's. And so they didn't necessarily know about transportation systems, although they have a lived experience, as we all do, in transportation systems. And so the process really started with Christy and I trying to talk about our ideas and then on their end, what sparks interest? What would be a, 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 a good way to tell this story? And then Joaquin had to put it all into some visual format. And so if I can say this on your podcast, uh, and Ryan will, uh, uh, Susan will appreciate this, is we start with a shitty first draft, meaning nothing is, nothing is uh, perfect. We don't want the artist to go through and have very detailed, fine artwork if we're right. really going to change it. Right. Um, yeah. 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 And that, that, that kind of makes sense too. And that's, that, that's one of the advice advices too, to, to authors is, you know, you know, that first draft is a shitty first draft, just get something out there. It's your, you're, you're working from that. I want to kind of go back a little bit to, it's kind of where it would set, set a little bit more of the foundation of, you know, your work, what you're really doing. And then I want to dive into uh, a couple of images that you've passed uh, uh, my way uh, about the, the actual comic book and, and really some fascinating things that I saw in there in terms of why comics are so powerful. Uh, but first, let's, let's talk a little bit about sustainable urban and urban planning and engineering research and, um, and, and really kind of, you know, what we're talking about here and, you know, kind of highlighting here transportation and land development. Yeah. So the work that I've been doing with Christy Kearns uh, for a long time is, again, looking at trying to examine where are some of the barriers that engineering standards and planning processes place on us moving away from the automobile and expanding our transportation options and uh, so we had a long-term collaboration with the city of Portland, the Portland Bureau of Transportation, in looking at their process and how can we improve it. And they helped fund a lot of our research along with the Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation. 
So one of the things that we were looking at here was a, an engineering and planning tool called the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Handbook and Manual. And this is a compilation of data about trip making, vehicle trip making by different land uses. And so it's used all over North America and in even uh, Australia. And it's, I think, part of the reason why a lot of our suburban development in particular looks the same everywhere. Uh, and so as you're, as you're developing an individual parcel or, your, or a lot, you use this handbook to evaluate what the transportation impacts of that new development will be on the system. And then cities often have a set of mitigations and fees that are charged for to developers to try to mitigate that. So one, one problem is that this handbook uh, is only looking at vehicle trips, has only historically looked at greenfield or suburban development, and doesn't have a lot of sophisticated controls or even simple controls for us to look at uh, development in different contexts. So some of our research in Portland, Oregon, looked at things like convenience stores, which are pretty standard size and format. Uh, but if you use the handbook as it, it, as it was anyway, uh, it would assume that a convenience store located in the central city or in a nearby neighborhood would generate the same number of automobile trips as something in the suburbs along a major arterial or highway. And so we, we collected a lot of data to demonstrate how far off that this can be. And in many cases, it over predicts automobile use, sometimes by a thousand percent. But if cities are relying on this data source, and then the other thing is the, the mitigations that happen when, um, when you assume more automobile traffic, some of those mitigations being widening lanes, adding more traffic lights, adding driveways, adding more parking, all of those things accommodate the car. And so even if these environments wouldn't have predicted so many automobile trips, the kinds of mitigations, or not predicted, but it resulted in so many automobile trips, the kind of mitigations that we tend to do in urban planning then make it less likely that people will take a mode other than driving. Right, yeah. And I love this graphic here of the, the new reverse traffic pyramid where we're really looking at um, trying to put a fine point on it <laughs> of that, you know, vehicles should be down here, you know, you know, sort of, you know, let's have the, you know, the, the real bulk of, of our transportation trips being done through active travel, which makes sense when we consider that, you know, a, a, a large number of trips are inherently walkable, bikeable, scootable, et cetera. So. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's fantastic. So, one of the things that that you know kind of uh, caught my attention was, uh, especially since I'm you know operating here in the vi the video and visual medium myself, is that that contrast between the the comic and and using this as a medium for um, for illustration and, and education and um, you know that our crumb panel was just fantastic on this and then comparing that to other forms and you you brought up the comparison of the research papers yeah this is much more interesting than than necessarily the research paper um, but you could take that data and that information from the research paper and bring it to life through the comic but then the other thing that was very interesting um, and i'll try to find this panel in here uh, in your presentation was about that compare and contrast you know to a, a video or movie um, talk a little bit about how, how powerful that is, and I'll try to find that, uh, that visual. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the advantages of comics, between, besides being fun and besides being a combination of visual and text, is that there's this idea of, of comics being permanent. And so what does that mean exactly? Well, it means that the reader decides how quickly they want to take in information. And so again, if you are listening to one of my lectures or watching a film, you get the information at the pace that I, I give it to you or that the film gives it to you. And books are also permanent, so text is permanent. So it means, but, but it, a book doesn't allow the visual in the same way that a comic. 
So it, it makes the idea uh, that you can spend as much time on a page or on a panel as you'd like. You can go back. You decide as the reader how you take in information. And I think that that's, that's one of the, the advantages of comics. You know, another idea in comic theory is the power of the gutter, so the space between panels. And that's really where your mind makes the transition, the passage of time or the passage of ideas or the transition from one character or another happens in the gutter, that blank space between the graphics. And I was talking about that, why that in, in, why is that is so powerful uh, as a learning tool? Because your brain actually has to do the work to think about those transitions. And I was, I was talking about this in my class recently, and one of the students said, oh, that's just like when you stop talking and ask a question, and we have this long, awkward silence in the class. Right, and I'm right. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, are you telling me to talk less? But yes, yeah, yeah. So there yeah. is some similar uh, similar ideas that we use in pedagogy and teaching um, that come forward in the graphic form in comics. Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, I think what you're you're referring to is is also this here. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. I never thought of it that way <laughs> before. And I'm like, Me oh, either. yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really fascinating. Well, um, this was part of that mind blowing moment in the first day of class that uh, right. Ryan Alexander Tanner gave me. So yeah, yeah. And there's some other really interesting things that you that you that you've included in here, and it, it talks a little bit about uh, some of these. Uh, bring bring this to life because I, I looked at this and I'm like, oh wow, yeah. This is this is quite fascinating. Yeah, this is a comic by uh, a Canadian uh, comic artist and transportation engineer and planner Ryan Martinson, and he has done a series of comics for the Canadian Institute of Transportation Engineers. And so I use this in a recent presentation because I think it really talks about those transitions from panel to panel. And so in this particular example, just the difference that an environment might feel the same exact environment from day to night. And if we don't think about nighttime environments and what we can do to sort of activate spaces at nighttime, then then they're ignored and underutilized. And so I, I really like this comic because in a very simple three, three panel comic, he illustrates this so very nicely and beautifully. Yeah, it, this also brought up a, an image or, or in my mind, the example of, you know, we're, we're striving to create all ages and abilities facilities and, you know, oftentimes what might seem, you know, all smiley and bright and cheery for, for one person might seem more like the second panel and, 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 and specifically thinking about like underpasses uh, and tunnels, uh, you know, for women, that might be that middle panel that might be really scary and it might be, you know, something very, very dark and yet, you know, it, you know maybe you know, for other people, uh, there might be, oh yeah, no, this is fine and cheery. And so that, that third panel of being, okay, but let's shine some light on it, or let's bring some, let's make some changes to the actual design of this facility so that it can be bright and cheery for everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, again, this visual gets to these ideas about emotion and feelings that the images can portray in a fun way, in a really powerful way. Um, so you bring up differences that women may feel or older adults versus youth um, and people with different mobility limitations. So again, comics can be a powerful tool to show representation, but also to communicate real differences. Right. Yeah. Which is exactly what this panel is talking about is, uh, you know, the differences and, and representation. Yeah. And, and again, if you're using real images from real life, it's sometimes hard to show environments or what we would like to achieve in planning. And so comics can can help do that. Well, what's interesting, too, I'm glad you mentioned that, is that, you know, maybe comics can better represent some, you know, the different people. Like, for instance, in the background here, you can see uh, someone is actually with a, a walker, you know, and, and is, is needing a walker there. Um, but since it's a graphic versus a photo, 
um, maybe someone can relate to that a little bit more because if it's a photo, to, to your point, um, maybe if that person doesn't quite look like them, they're like, oh yeah, that's not me. I, do, I, I can't see that in, in there. So I don't know, maybe that's just my interpretation of that is it might be better or easier to recognize or identify with somebody. Yeah, and empathize, right? And empathize. So, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think another point that in this panel is that translation to other languages. So we translated the comic into Spanish. There are some challenges in doing that. So once you've made the comic, you have sort of fixed sizes for the, the text uh, bubbles and, uh, the, and dialogue. But again, you know, one of the things, so I was, I was making it when we started this project, I was living in Portland, Oregon. Christy was living in Tucson, Arizona, very, very different built environments. So thinking about how we have that representation of not just people, but also places in the comic um, is also important. So again, one of the things that we think about in, in planning is density and density can also be a four letter word when you're talking with community groups. And so how you can show density isn't, you know, doubling of density is often just adding a one floor to the built environment, right? right. And so I think that, that particularly when we talk about the built environment, that comics and visuals can have a way of explaining these things that really can ground this in reality for people, even though we're not in reality, where you're actually in a comic. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're actually in a comic. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you, 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 you get to, you know, having a, a product that's out there. And um, how, how are people accessing the information or accessing the comic? Yeah, great question. So you can download the comic from the National Institute of Transportation and Communities. It's in a digital format that you can read online. It's also meant to be shared. So we're hoping that people pass it around, that, pe that community groups, advocacy groups, uh, planning agencies um, post it on their own website. So um, it's very, it's meant to be open access. There's also a link where um, people can download a high res version and make a print copy. Um, so we did make a limited run of print copy in Spanish and English and have been disseminating those slowly. And I'm not sure if this is still uh, offered by the National Institute of Transportation and Communities, but there was a, a link on their website where you could request a print copy if you wanted one. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll check that out. We'll try to figure out if that's still available and we'll be sure to include um, in the show notes for this episode, uh, those links as well as in the video description down below. Yeah. You can also download those from my own uh, research lab website, superlab.space. Um, so yeah. there's a link there to download them as well. Yeah. And I just clicked on this. And so we do see the uh, uh, version in Spanish as well. Yeah, so we worked with a PhD student at, at Portland State University in urban uh, studies and planning, Gabriel uh, Quinones Zambrana, and he is from Puerto Rico. And uh, we worked together on the translation, and that was a lot of fun and also surprisingly difficult because he kept asking me, what version of Spanish would you like? Do you want more formal language? Which we spent a lot of time talking about which word is the right word. Right, um, right. Yeah. 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 What is the actual meaning? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So one of the things uh, you want, let's go ahead and just uh, address a little bit of, of, of this stage in terms of what you're, what you're looking at here. Yeah. So uh, this was actually before we finalized the comic. So we sent a draft out to some folks that were, faculty in transportation, as well as practitioners. And we sent them an early draft and said, you know, we, we have four, four questions for you. You know, do we make any mistakes in the information that we are conveying? So is everything accurate? Are we communicating the ideas that you think are, are the most essential? Because again, there's an economy of words and an economy of, of images. Is it understandable? And then most important question, did they enjoy reading it? And we actually got a, a lot of feedback and we incorporated that feedback, simplified some things, 
you know, where things were maybe more confusing or they didn't understand an image or, or they thought the text was too long winded. We made a lot of changes in response to that feedback and it was very helpful. So this happened before the final version. Hmm. Wow. That's fantastic. Uh, we also had a community. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, it's like, it's so tempting to just kind of do things in, in a vacuum and say, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, this is, that's a, an incredibly important step. Well, as an academic, we're used to peer review, right? So I, I think, you know, the thing for, uh, for me in this process that was probably most difficult and, and probably for Christy too, although I don't want to speak for her, is that the language that we use in our academic communication is so nuanced we are always talking about the limitations. What can we draw from this conclusion? What can't we draw? And so it, it's part of the reason why this is, I think, difficult for non-academics to read the work. And where we were really challenged in this work is, you know, what is it that we want to say? And the public's not going to hang on for all the asterisks and footnotes and yeah, buts. So it, it really, um, it we needed this foot foot feedback from the technical advisory committee to make sure that we weren't generalizing too much or saying things in grand platitudes that that maybe they that the profession wasn't uncomfortable was uncomfortable with yeah and I, I, you might have been about to to say this but did you also have like uh, lay people also have a chance to to look at it and and be able to make sure that you de uh uh you know, kind of like got rid of, uh, you know, because if it's just the technical people, maybe, you know, a lot of the, the acronyms and a lot of the, you know, insider baseball kind of language uh, slipped through. Yeah. So we actually had a community advisory committee, actually two community advisory committees, uh, one in Tucson and one in Portland, Oregon. One was from a particular neighborhood group uh, recruited from a neighborhood group. And then the other was from an advocacy group in Tucson that sent out the comic to their constituents. And we had a, an online survey so people could give us feedback there. And the questions that we asked them were very similar. So did they understand the comic? Was it free of jargon and sort of technical language? Uh, did they see themselves in it? So this back to this issue of representation. So was this a, an experience that they could relate to? And then, it, and then again, back to the most important question: Did they like it? Did they enjoy it? Was it fun to read? Right. Yeah. And I, I probably should have went to the next slide because there it is: the the <laughs> community advisory committee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got some valuable feedback there, and incorporated, you know, into the the final result. What were the most salient learnings and things that you know? It came through for you in this process? Um, I think, you know, I'm hoping this isn't my last comic, but it was my first one. And so I think the learning curve for everyone was high. And I think, you know, one of the things that I said earlier is just, you know, as an academic, we, we use a lot of jargon and then we have a lot of caveats and we try tend to speak very carefully about our research. And that can be very confusing. And so comics can actually help with some of this nuance. So it's not like we had to gloss over some of the, those caveats and limitations. We could actually try to incorporate them into the comic. And again, the use of visuals carrying some of the weight of that communication. The other thing is interdisciplinary work, which is something that I have tried to do my entire career, is, is very difficult difficult to do. It's not like the just because the will is there doesn't make it any less difficult. So we all learned from each other. I think, you know, having Susan currently there to help with the storytelling, to have Ryan there as the master editor, like none of us could have completed this project without the other. So if one of us had dropped out, uh, we couldn't have done this work. I guess the other thing that I was thinking about here is is also how I had to let go of some pieces. So working interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary framework meant that, you know, the art is all uh, Joaquin Golas's art. Of course, we had the opportunity to comment and make changes and so on. Um, but stylistically, is it my style of drawing? No, it's his style of drawing. So also just part of teamwork means, you know, having to make compromises and... Yeah. 
And to use a transportation analogy, stay in my lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is which is kind of your 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 graphic here is like yeah it's it's challenging but it's rewarding and I yeah there you go stay in your lane. Is is this something that you will go back to and 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 use as a uh, a future medium? I hope so. So if I were to try to make the comic myself, it would be a very slow process because I am not a comic artist. Uh, but now that I am located at the University of British Columbia, um, I'm interested in doing this not just for my research, but other research within urban planning and engineering. I'm also very keen to collaborate, you know, to get the band back together. So we spent all this time learning about each other and learning how we work. And so I would really treasure the opportunity to work with Ryan and Susan again and Christy, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pull up the, uh, um, the free to download and share uh, the QR code here uh, for folks. And again, I'll, I'll, I will actually also have the uh, links in the show notes. So you can certainly uh, click on that link as well. But if you feel so inclined, you can shoot your, uh, your cell phone camera at this or your iPad or whatever. Uh, and to be able to do that, it's... I'm fascinated by this, you know, uh, from the storytelling, you know, angle of this, because this is one of the, the biggest challenges that we have. And, and I have a background in science as well, you know, in, in physiology, human physiology. And, and, you know, we end up talking in these jargony, wonky, you know, sort of language. And it's really, really difficult for uh, for people. And it's just like, oh, right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you have to, you know, de-jargon stuff, but then you also have to have tell a compelling narrative and and story and is that something that you're also kind of looking at in terms of you know your your future work is how do we take the data and the stuff that is is so necessary from a research perspective and from uh of we need to go in this direction perspective but then be able to translate that into narrative yeah, absolutely. I think it's changed the way I'm thinking about writing. So even writing in academic articles. So, you know, how do we tell a story? What is the point of this? How are we drawing people in? So whether the audience are fellow academics or other other academics outside of transportation or to the public. I think the thing about transportation that is compelling for this narrative is, again, everyone has a lived experience trying to navigate the world and to move around in it. So we naturally have a way to draw people in and, and relate to people's experiences, which may not be true of other scientific kinds of research. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't yet mentioned about this project or uh, your work that you, um, also, you know, want to leave the uh, audience with? I think we've talked about a lot of a lot of it. So the, the process of making the comic, the inspiration for the comic. I guess one other aspect that we haven't talked about is that there are a lot of resources for people to get out and make their own comics. So comics are having a moment right now, and it's not just formal comics. There's zines. There's they're easy to make. They're fun to make. You don't have to be an expert draftsman to make a comic. Uh, so Joaquin obviously is a, is a very talented artist, but uh, comics can be made with simple stick figures, right? They're very important uh, communication tools and the art doesn't have to be sophisticated to get the point across. So, so I would like to see comics, you know, not just made by academics and, and professional comic artists, but the general public. Yeah. It makes me wonder too. Um, in in looking at, we're actually scrolling through, folks. Uh, we're actually scrolling through the the actual comic right here. It also makes me wonder whether AI can start helping with some of the you know the the imagery, um, because that's kind of what what we're seeing with some of the um, uh, the urbanism AI interfaces is is we're, we're typing in. Uh, you know, a, a descriptor, and then it's coming up with uh, opportunities. And that's one of the things when I interviewed uh, Adam Katz with Better Streets AI, is that's kind of what was happening. And so this could in, end up being an interesting um, combination of 
being able to type in something and then get an imagery and then actually then do what we have here, which is a panel saying, you know, and have the, the you know, kind of what you were saying you were trying to describe. Um, and that gets to your point is maybe you don't have to be a talented graphic artist. Um, you know, you might be able to, you know, let the computer do a little bit of that work these in the future. Yeah. And of course, this is an evolving field with lots of limitations and concerns and so on, but also a lot of power. And I think the one of the concerns would be about representation. So if it's learning from content on the web and we know that transportation and just web content in general tends to be dominated by white, cisgendered, male, able-bodied uh, voices, and so how do we how do we counter that with AI and make sure that we're we're using comics for what we want them to do, which is increase representation. Right. And, uh, and a great and a great place for me to pause on this, where you know the center panel here, you know, is, is a panel where we yeah, it looks like we do have a, a good uh, diversity of representation here. Yeah. But I also think to your point about not, n- you know, not needing to create the art yourself. I mean, collage is a, you know, a thing that we often uh, did when we were kids. And it's now, I mean, it has always been a, an important art form, but, you know, cutting, cutting images out of magazines and pasting and juxtaposing those kinds of images are another way to make comics or make, uh, add the visuals uh, that are, are easy for people to do. Assume, assuming again that the representation and the, the imagery is out there in the first place. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. So fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Um, what is the, uh, the best way for, for folks to connect with you? Yeah. Well, so the best way to connect with me is through my professional email at the University of British Columbia and the School of Community and Regional Planning. So uh, you have my email there and then I have a website where my research is and you can also download the comic at superlab.space and uh, uh, yeah, and then on LinkedIn. So you can reach out to me, Kelly J. Clifton on LinkedIn. And that's how we got connected. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you're still waiting. And you're still, still waiting. To waiting. Cross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, aren't we all, right? Yeah. So we, I think we this we is, are. We are. Yeah. I yeah. think this is the thing about the topic itself, right? So yeah. cities are really changing, yeah. transportation modes are changing, they're changing all the time. And so, you know, how can we on one hand play catch up to remedy some of the ills of the past while at the same time Modes are changing, cities are changing, and the population is changing. So, Yes, fantastic. Kelly, yeah. thank you so much. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Same. I really enjoyed being here, and uh, I look forward to, to talking again. Hey, thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Kelly Clifton. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below, and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying the Active Towns podcast and the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon. Uh, buy me a coffee. Uh, you can also do it via YouTube Super. Thanks, right below. <laughs> as well as making donations to the nonprofit and buying things from the Active Town store. Hey, every little bit helps and is much appreciated. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.